What's the most satisfying no you've ever given? I used to be a chef. At this particular place, which was quite upmarket, I was the sous chef, the number two. We made food that required a lot of work. The average person would have five to six courses in a sitting, and it was all very considered and time consuming. Every day, we'd start at 8 a.m. to prepare for dinner and finish around 11 p.m., just to give you an idea. Anyway, one night after everyone else had cleaned down and were out the back having a beer and a dury, I was pottering around the kitchen, ordering things and writing lists, and some friends of the owner came in buzzed and demanded to see the menu. The bar was open, but the kitchen was done and dusted, not just closed, clean, over. The waitress who was still on asked me if we could do it, knowing full well that we couldn't, but asked anyway because she was just doing her job. I say no, but I can put something together for them on the house. Some cheese and bread or even a few desserts. You gotta look after the drinkers, right? That's hospitality. Plus, I cannot ask my crew to fire up the kitchen again because one, it'll take an hour at the very least to bring the kitchen back online. Two, we wouldn't have half the mise in place. And three, bugger off because we've been here for 14 hours and I can't do that to my team. Even offering what I was already offering represented another few hours there for me cleaning and finishing my other duties, but I'm being nice here. So I give them the compromise of cheese and dessert. No, waitress comes back. They don't want dessert, they want dinner. I compromise again. I'll cook them all a steak with sides and sauce and all that good stuff. And I've got some fish if they want to eat that. And I could do a veg dish too. I'll hook these guys up. They're going to love it. Personally, if I was hammered and a place was willing to cook me steak at 11.30 p.m., I'd be stoked, but I wasn't raised by wolves. But again, no, they want the full menu, the fresh ravioli, the pate and freaking croute, the beef poached and butter. Just no, we can't just knock that up in 20 minutes. The full menu takes hours of preparation and a full crew in a fired up kitchen. You can't have it. You can't. Even if you were here just two hours ago, you could have had the full braised flamingo tongue and pickled wet sits or whatever the hell you wanted. But now you can get fed. Happy to do that. It's my pleasure. The waitress once more tells them that the full menu is off, but the chef will cook you a lovely meal, etc., etc. And still, no. Please make them understand what they are actually requesting. So the waitress goes back and once more tries to explain the situation and why certain practical realities are preventing us from offering the complete menu. Then some buzzed witch from the table actually rolls up to the pass and calls me a lazy jerk to my face. The guy who is offering to cook you a steak dinner on the house in his 15th hour of a shift is a lazy jerk, huh? Okay. So I turned my back on her, turned the lights off in the kitchen, and went outside and sat down for a beer to complete my ordering and have a giggle with my workmates. Just ignored them. Apologized to the waitress because essentially she now had a situation to deal with, but yeah, nah, not happening. Then they tried to take the earlier offer of steak and fish, etc. LOL. This was the final crushing no that I took so much pleasure from. Not actually delivered to their face, by the way. Again, the beleaguered waitress. And no matter how mad they got, there was no one else to help them achieve their goals of eating nice food. They had every chance to be reasonable, and they squandered those chances until it was too late. They could have chosen prime steak and brunet sauce, but they chose defeat. Of course, they were livid, as only buzzed peasants with too much money can be. And they had a word with the owner the next day, and like the pathetic cast jerk he was, he chewed me out about it, but it was worth it. All right, so that was a sweet one to read, the first one. I'd break my back to help someone who is nice to me, or at least someone I can tell is genuinely a good person. But whoa, if you piss me off. Feels great for real justice sometimes, don't it? Let's go on to the next story. Story two. My substance-dependent sister's kids were taken by DCFS when they learned what she'd been doing. I drove from Chicago to Los Angeles and spent six months and $20,000 to get her and her deadbeat husband cleaned. They had been living in their rented car, begging by day for enough money for the next trip and enough to pay for the car. I showed up and within three days they had a vehicle of their own, a three-bedroom private home, and they were on the road to recovery. Six months later, I left thinking they were okay and knowing that they were less than a month away from getting their kids back. They got strung out before I got 100 miles away. Their kids were adopted by a wonderful family. But my sister wouldn't give up, saying that she's their mother and only she knows what's best for them. She hit rock bottom, or so I thought, left her husband, went back to Florida to live with my mother and get clean. 
Three weeks later, she's involved with a new boyfriend, another substance dependent, and she's strung out like hell. California relents and tells her that if she sends letters to the judge, they'll look into the case again. I get a phone call from my mom, who is crying happy tears, asking me to write the letter. I dabble in writing, so grammar, punctuation, etc. I refuse. Enough is enough. My sister starts blowing up my phone. I don't answer. She keeps texting me. Story 3. Was hired for a company on a temp-to-perm basis. My boss, the controller, was a controlling, micromanaging, my way or the highway, grade-A jerk. After three months, he offered me a permanent position at less than the rate I was earning as a temp. I had been job searching anyway and managed to postpone giving a definitive answer for a couple of weeks. In the meantime, I was offered a job elsewhere for 30% more than what I was earning. I accepted that position but still waited a couple days to give the controller my answer. Finally, exasperated, he demanded I come into his office and give him an answer. He thought himself a strong negotiator, so I took my time laying out every single argument as to why he should pay me more. In the short time I've been here, I've done X, Y, and Z, improved this, streamlined that, and I just went on and on. You could tell he was getting impatient. He kept wanting to interrupt and nail me down with his counter-arguments. He was champing at the bit like nobody's business. So I finally wrapped it up with, So given all these accomplishments and what an asset I'd be, I'm sure you can understand why. Here I slipped my offer letter from the other company across his desk. I'm going to work somewhere else. His face turned crimson and the vein in his temple visibly throbbed. I actually thought he was going to lose it. So I pushed it just a tad further. I start at my new place in 10 days. I know you're really short-staffed here. If you like, we can discuss me staying on until then to give you time to find a replacement. Otherwise, today's my last day. He can barely eke out an, okay, thanks, we'll talk more later today. I return to my cubicle and my co-worker, whose cube was next to mine, apparently overheard the entire exchange. She snuck up behind me, gave me a big hug, and whispered in my ear, that was awesome. Later that day, he had the assistant controller ask me to stay on for the next 10 days. He never spoke to me again. Hmm. And at which point he should say, that'll be fine. By the way, did I mention my new fee is $200 an hour? Story 4. Worked in a 10-people automotive design company for four years as a 3D modeler was the only 3D modeler at the time. The clients loved me, gave me job offers, and I'd taken over all the IT work in the studio. For some reason, my boss stopped sending me out to clients though, which was strange as they had promised to keep requesting me. Instead of my 3D modeling job, he had me run the CNC milling machine, which is pretty dull and boring work. I requested a raise as my performance had been good and I had taken over much more responsibility than my job would normally have entailed. He claimed I was currently an overpaid milling operator and should not complain about my pay. Obviously, I was pretty pissed, but stayed at the company, planning to send out some CVs and then quit when I got a better offer. About a week later, I made a mistake during a milling job, not on purpose, and got an angry phone call from my boss at 10 p.m. Went into work the next day to fix the mistake and had it fixed after about 30 minutes. My boss came in 30 minutes later and started an argument about how dare I make a mistake like that, At this point, I no longer cared about my job as I had had enough, so I made the comment that not everyone can be as perfect as he is at operating the milling machine, and that I am sure he had never made a mistake like this ever before. One hour later, we had agreed on instant termination, and I packed up my stuff and said my goodbyes to the team. They all couldn't believe that I had been let go about such a BS matter and were asking who would be doing the IT 3D modeling in the future. It wasn't my problem, so I told them to ask the boss. Of course, instant unplanned termination meant there was no documentation for any of my IT work, and no one had a chance to ask me how to do anything related to my job. Evil laugh. And now, the best part. I returned to my home and made three calls to competitor companies. The company I worked for was known to be really good at work during crunch time, so they all seemed very eager to get to know me. Straight on the phone, I got invited to come and do some test work for two of the companies in the next two days, so straight away, my mood was lifted. Then there was a knock at the door. My boss had come to my home to tell me the computers were doing some weird stuff and if I could come back and fix it for him. Me telling him to get screwed was the best thing that could have happened to me after the whole ordeal. The panic look on his face made it clear that he had recognized his mistake and that two whole departments just collapsed the moment I had walked out the door. Also, he would have to do all the milling work instead of doing his management work as there was no one else in the company who knew how. 
I aced the job interview at both of the other companies, and now I have a good position earning almost double of what I did before. That fight and the resulting job change was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. All right, get on this guy, high five. Skilled positions like his are in high demand and I'm glad he capitalized on that opportunity. He doesn't have to worry about AI. Liking the video so far though, please don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Story five. I'm a small time landlord. When I was just getting into things, I made some bad mistakes. The neighbor of one of my properties is a very friendly guy when I was doing renovations would constantly pop over to chat. Turns out his son and his girlfriend are looking for a place to live. Great, saves me the trouble of having to hunt down a renter, I thought. I run a background check and there are some red flags, but nothing they can't plausibly explain. They spend the next several months putting me through hell. They never paid their rent on time and towards the end didn't pay up at all. They trashed the house. There was little in the way of permanent damage, but it was absolutely filthy. They ground cigarette butts into the carpet and wrote booty on the side of the tub, etched it in and went over it in nail polish. I ended up evicting them and getting a judgment against them. I figured I'd never collect and never hear from them. Fast forward two years, the house is empty. I just had a tenant leave and I was about to start doing turnover. My phone goes off one day. It's my former tenant. His girlfriend left him. He's back living at home and he really wants a place to say. Not in your freaking life. Story 6. After my grandfather passed away, we had the usual thing where people come out of the woodwork because they think they're entitled to some part of the leftovers. So I went to my bank to deposit some cash in my account like usual and my grandfather's financial advisor was there. She recognized me and asked if she could talk to me and she began trying to butter me up into accepting her proposal that we liquidate absolutely everything in the estate. This meant that I'd lose my car, the roof over my head, and my mom would lose her car as well as that was also under the estate. Considering this was right after my grandfather passed, I just knew there was an ulterior motive. So I said no. As the last surviving member of that side of the family who had control over the fate of my grandfather's estate, I wasn't about to risk losing everything. She got all angry and told me I was being a fool, but I doubled down on my decision and told her that they could have everything over my dead body. Turned out to be a smart decision because some lawyers got to my mentally disabled aunt, long story, and took pretty much all of the cash in the estate, leaving, you guessed it, all the property that we chose not to liquidate. The conspiracy theorist in me wants to believe the cogs were turning for my aunt's lawsuit way before I ever knew about it, and the advisor was paid off or something by these lawyers so they could get more of the stuff they shouldn't have. Thankfully, she was relieved of her job not long after that. Just knowing in hindsight that I stopped a lot of damage and screwing myself over by telling that jerk to piss off with her boneheaded proposal makes it feel all the more satisfying. Story 7. I was working in a toxic, limiting environment wearing more hats than a British royal with new responsibilities popping up every day. I would never say no because I enjoyed the challenge. However, when I pointed out my value but received a paltry increase, I decided to leave. I got a job offer that would basically double my salary and delivered my resignation letter and all hell broke loose. A group of them took me out to lunch as a sort of intervention and basically did what they did best, deliver the hard sell. I'm integral to the business. They'll open up a career advancement path for me if I'll just hang in there, yada, 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 yada. Then they made their counter offer knowing full well how much my offer was for and freaking lowballed me. Like I couldn't do simple math and would be swayed by a fancy lunch and the romantic idea of company loyalty. It's the best we can do, just wasn't good enough. I got pulled aside by just about every single higher up over the next two weeks and they all progressively sweetened the pot. I stood firm. Easiest snows of my life. I actually left that job with a sense of survivor's guilt about the people I left behind. Yeah, I could really feel the satisfaction while reading this one. Sucks about the survivor's guilt though. Story 8. My wife volunteered at a place where she routinely had contact with the public. She met new people all the time, but really clicked with one woman in particular. They went out for coffee, found out they had a lot in common, and agreed both couples should see a movie or have dinner or something together. One evening, the woman calls my wife and says something like, I think we are right near your house. If you're free, can we drop by and our husbands can meet? 
Sure, we talk for a bit. I can see why my wife gets along with the woman so well. And then suddenly, the guy hands me some kind of brochure. It's Amway by another name, one of the spin off companies. Nope. Sure, cool, just take a look, okay? Next day, the woman calls again. Hey, the regional manager happens to be in town. He's a really great person, and I think you should meet him and you can tell him what you think of the stuff we showed you. Nope. I'll put everything you left me outside the door if you need it. We're not interested and there's nothing to talk about. Half an hour later, the doorbell rings and the manager, who I have never met before, finds our door unlocked and walks in, followed by our new quote-unquote friends. I don't really think you understand the opportunity you're passing up here. I said the thing that every homeowner should say at least once, get the hell out of my house. You don't need to be rude about it. You haven't heard me saying no yet, so obviously I do. They skulked out and that was that. Greatest no I have ever uttered. Story 9. I'd lost thousands of dollars, around 7k, intending to marry a woman child 10 years ago, and I lost it all because we called off the wedding so close to the event. Had we gone through with the wedding, a financial mess would have eventually resulted from divorce, so I just forced myself to look on the bright side. A couple of months later, she received two $1,000 checks, 2K total, from a travel insurance company covering the loss on the honeymoon we were supposed to take, one check for each of us since the policy was in both our names. This was also about a week or two after I found out, before I could finish sweeping the floors to the apartment she moved out of, that she was currently getting with a friend of mine. They eventually got married and had kids, and there was a level of shady that made the time overlap never sit right with me. He lost a lot of friends as a result of that. She reaches out to a mutual friend of ours and asks them if she could leave a check in my name with them. The check was received from the travel insurance company to cover the loss of the honeymoon. She wanted me to sign it over to her. Her thinking was that she would pay for the honeymoon and I would pay for everything else, since I made more money than her and everything else cost more. She did not understand that when in a relationship, expenses, savings, and debt are all fungible. I made more than her, but that did not mean that I picked out the flowers, the band, the limos without her input. I told our mutual friends that she should not have involved them and that it was rude of her. If she wished for me to sign the check over to her, she could go ahead and call me and ask me herself. So she calls. Hey, it's Jay. I have a check here in your name. Me? Did you receive the email of itemized expenses I incurred as a result of calling off this wedding and your bum being almost $25,000 in credit card debt with nearly 30% APRs across three cards? Did I mention that part? J. No, I'm not reading your emails. I don't care what you lost. I want my money. Me? I know you think it's your money even though we'd agreed to pool our money for all of the costs. I know you don't care what I lost. This is why I couldn't spend the rest of my life with you. So, in regard to signing over the $1,000 check to you, I think you should hand me the check to help cover the expenses I incurred because you needed to have a $5,000 wedding band, $2,000 in flow. And then she hung up on me. So, the most satisfying no I ever gave, I never got the chance to say. It was glorious. It doesn't end there, though. Four years later, my father calls me and tells me there is a state website for undeclared funds. He said my name was on there and to check it out, I look into it and lo and behold, it's the $1,000 in my name from the travel insurance. I just figured she'd forge my signature and cash the check, wouldn't have put it past her. Well damn, if I didn't hunt that money down. Took me a few months to get the proof and get through to the right people, but I got my check. And what did I do with it? I took my current wife out to dinner at Del Fresco Double Eagle Steakhouse, ordered a bottle of Stag's Leap Artemis, bought her flowers, went to a Broadway show, and celebrated her for being just an awesome, freaking beautiful person. Best thousand dollars I ever spent on the only woman I ever truly loved. Yikes. That which was delusional. Also, congrats to this guy for finding the right one. It's good to hear there's a happy ending to this one. Story 10. I used to work as a refrigeration tech and had a job at the only employer in my county. They treated me like crap, cutting pay and benefits, giving us the bare essentials to do our jobs and complaining when it takes us longer. Then another company opened up an office and started hiring a few of us. They offered me a job as a lead tech with a bunch of benefits. Now these folks and I clicked and I knew we would get along. My old employer came to my house and begged me on a literal bent knee not to quit. 
They made this speech about how they would give me whatever I wanted. I looked at this man who had treated me so bad and just said, no, now get out of my house. All right, if you felt like you related to these stories, here's more. YouTube thinks you're going to love this. I'll catch you in that video, and thanks for being with me on this one.